I'm Josh Schneiderweiler, coming up on Football Today. On February 22nd, Barcelona hosted Ibar at the Camp Nou Stadium. On the surface, everything looked perfect that day. Barcelona cruised to a 5-0 win, and Lionel Messi dominated the game, scoring four goals. Dragging, dishing, Messi dribbles his way into four, set up by the newcomer, and it's another sombrero for the Argentine. However, that day, Barcelona's typically jubilant crowd was replaced by a far more seditious, rebellious one. There were thousands of white handkerchiefs all around the stadium. Many fans booed and whistled. The message seems to be, we are with the team, we are with the players, we aren't with the president. We could also see this other banner in the stands. No to lies, no to slander, yes to elections. Bartomeu, out. Earlier in the same week, Barca's board was accused of hiring a company that publicly smeared both current and former Barcelona players. Now, less than two months later, six of their board members have publicly resigned. Today we ask, what is Barcagate and why is there chaos on the Barca board? When we found out that six board directors at Barcelona had resigned, I don't think anyone was particularly surprised, except by the number. Sid Lowe is a writer and broadcaster for The Guardian and ESPN.com. We knew that Josep Maria Bartomeu, the president, had moved against four board members and tried to force them out. We thought that their reaction, their best way, if you like, to get revenge on Bartomeu was going to be to hold on to stay in there, to not move away, to not allow him to force them to walk. But when they eventually did, it wasn't a huge surprise. What was a surprise was that it was no longer four, it was now six. These board members wrote a resignation letter that kind of accompanied their leaving the board. What did it say? The letter that they did, and they deposited it with a notary rather than taking it to the press, but they deposited it with a notary because I I, I think they wanted this to have a kind of a legal framework. Essentially, it said that the six of them were resigning because they felt they could no longer control the direction the board was taking. They could no longer control the direction the management of the club was taking. And it was a direction that they could no longer accept. Within that, there are a couple of other things that they pointed out. And I think the most significant of those was that they demanded that the results of a, a supposedly external investigation into what became known as Barca Gate, that those results would be known and that those people responsible would be held to justice and also that any money that the club had lost be paid back. Now, the Barca Gate case, of course, was um, related to Barcelona having a social media monitoring company that had set up sock accounts and bots online, which had been there to try and protect the reputation of the club's president. But in doing so, had not just done that, but had also attacked some opposition figures and indeed even some of the players still at the club. And the irony of all that is that it's not even like they needed an anonymous social media account to kind of criticize players if they wanted to do that even. I mean, they had their own sporting director, Eric Abidal, do that, which Messi pointed out kind of publicly as well. When things don't go well on the pitch, the players are the first ones to recognize as much. Those in the sporting department at the club should also take responsibility for their actions and decisions. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, you know, there's another layer to that irony, which is they also had a significant part of the media in Catalonia doing it for them. In particular, the the Godot group, which basically means in in sporting terms, El Mundo Deportivo, but also means La Vanguardia, are very much on the side of this board of directors, very much defenders of them. And we've seen that in their reaction to this. And so, as you say, you you, you didn't necessarily need these online accounts. And that's one of the doubts about this, by the way, is is the extent to which this was mechanised, the extent to which this was deliberate or whether it was a company kind of going beyond the call of duty. And then you have uh, Eric Abidal also being critical. That said, Eric Abidal was critical in a way that was not useful, didn't help, and only served really to bring the division into the open. Because, of course, when Abidal had suggested that the players had not been happy with Valverde, some of the players, and in particular Leo Messi, who came out and said so publicly, were not going to let that go. They were not going to let that go because they had actually defended Valverde as a manager. And they thought, of all of the things that we get blamed for, we will not carry, uh, and to use the Spanish phrase, we will not carry this dead body. You know, let someone else have this dead body. So why didn't the board know about this 1 million euro contract that paid for these public relations services? 
that's the key question in all this. Why didn't they know? When the investigation into this is carried out and when the results are made public and it's been carried out by PricewaterhouseCoopers, I think what we will see is there will be two elements to it. One will be the question of the morality, if you like, the ethics of the whole thing. And the other will be the financial element to this. And the financial element helps to explain part of your question because... The accusation is that this was a contract worth in the region of a million euros, around about 980,000 euros, but that all of the payments were made in instalments for amounts under 200,000 euros. Now, why is that significant? That's significant because any payment of 200,000 euros or above automatically triggers an internal audit. In other words, you find out about it if you're on the board. The fact that all of those payments come in at just under 200,000 and come in, how do we put this, suspiciously or conveniently close to that amount, but conveniently just the other side, suggests an attempt at the very least to not have the difficulty of this being kind of, if you like, on the table for an audit, on the table for someone to say, well, hang on a minute, what's this payment? What's this for? Why are we doing this? Should we be doing this? And of course, that's what provoked, after the resignation of these board members, Emilie Rousseau in particular, who was one of the six, a vice president of the club, to come out and say directly, and the quote was, someone has had their hand in the till. Well, we'll get to them in a minute, but these reports came out in February, which was obviously a little while ago. So what was the reaction at the time to those reports? And then how has it kind of changed or evolved since? Well, the reaction at the time, as quite often I think happens with this, is that the first response was to deny this. So this was a story that was broken by Cadena Ser Radio in Catalonia, and Barcelona denied it. Then, of course, as often is the case when an expose is, is handled very well by a media organization, what Cadena Ser was did was then, if you like, add bits to the story, each step to the story. So it's denied. And they said, well, here we go. Here's the contracts. Then it's denied that, no, no, but that company wasn't actually employed to have a go at players. It wasn't employed to bad mouth people. It wasn't employed to protect the president. It was employed to be a social media monitor, which lots and lots of clubs do. And by the way, lots of clubs absolutely do do this. So then the next stage is this go, well, here's a demonstration. You see these accounts, these online news accounts, these online media accounts, these social media accounts that are criticizing Joan Laporte Xavi Hernandez. There's even one about Leo Messi's wife. There's, there's this kind of, if you like, these kind of pseudo media online. What Cadena Ser then did was demonstrate that the companies that were behind those websites were indeed related to i3 Ventures. And i3 Ventures were the company that Barcelona had employed. So of course, then what do you get? You get the next stage, which is Barcelona saying, we paid them to monitor social media. We certainly didn't pay them for this. And so then you get that question mark about, okay, so what has happened here? And that's when the audit happens. That's when the club says, okay, there has to be an audit. We have to find out what's happened. Obviously, there will be significant numbers of board members who didn't know, but there must be some who did. And so an audit is set up. Now, in the meantime, they suspend without pay Mas Ferrer, who is the, if you like, the, the presidential advisor. He's the closest person to Bartomeu and he gets suspended while this investigation goes on. Now, there's all sorts of questions about whether he's still there in the background, but he gets suspended. So the initial response from Barcelona is to say, we will investigate this. This cannot be, we will investigate it. So now we're waiting for the next stage. We're waiting for the results of that investigation. Now, my suspicion at this stage is that investigation will tell us about the amount of money paid and whether that amount of money is too high for this kind of service and therefore whether perhaps it hides something else. And I think we will probably get an economic conclusion from that investigation rather than an ethical or moral conclusion. And when do you think we might be able to get those results? I think this has come to a head because some of the bits of those results have been filtered through. People have become aware of some of the some of the information in that report. But of course, we're on coronavirus lockdown. And what we've been told, and again, you know, everything you get told, you have to take with a pinch of salt, in particular in the midst of what looks like a a really quite open power battle at the club now and and a crisis with things falling apart. What we've been told is that some of the investigation has to be done in presential interviews. In other words, it cannot be fully completed until after the lockdown is ended. The other elements of this, of course, is what happens is that this investigation will be presented to the club and then it will be a club disciplinary commission that decides what to do with that evidence. And I think that while we don't know the the mechanics behind this, that we have to ask questions about which members of the board will be on that commission and what will their kind of where will their loyalties lie? What will their position be when it comes to analysing the findings and deciding what to do with them? (laughs) 
I think one of the most important people involved is someone that you already mentioned, Emily Roussad. And it would be great if you could describe who he is and how he kind of factors into all of this. Well, I think put very simply, and, and this in a way underlines how bad the situation at Barcelona is. Here's the most simple way of looking at it. Emilio Roussard is the man who was encouraged to resign by Joseph Maria Bartomeu, the president, and then two days later resigned, uh, having originally said he would not do so. And then the very next day went in the media and made accusations that there was a hand in the till and went to lots of different media and has been very vociferous since. Eh, la corrupción es algo fáctico, ya está probada. Es decir, se trocearon determinados contratos a los efectos de evadir los controles internos del club. Y eso es corrupción. Now, that's that part of it, which would make you think, wouldn't it, that this is a man who is very aggressively in opposition to this board of directors, very much a man that Bartomeu doesn't trust, very much someone who has fallen out with them, that's part of that power battle at the heart of the board of directors. Right, all of that you could stand up. But here's the crux to this, the real key thing to this that underlines how bad the situation has got. It was only in January that Roussard was made a vice president and he was made a vice president because he was the man that Bartomeu was setting up to be his successor when the next presidential election come around. In other words, this was the guy handpicked by Bartomeu to continue Bartomeu's work. And now he's the guy who Bartomeu has tried to force out, who has resigned and who has most vociferously attacked Bartomeu. And all of this has happened in, what is it, just under three months. You say how he's so vociferous in his, you know, attacks on the club. He said, quote, the existence of corruption within the club is patent and it's well founded and demonstrable. So he's really going after the club here. And he even set up a website like, you know, what does that tell us? Well, exactly. And it, it can tell you a number of things, obviously. And, and, and as you can probably imagine, there have been a huge amount of criticisms of him. I think partly because of the manner in which he said these things as much as the actual content of what he said, partly because there's been a sense that, hang on, what is what we're seeing here really actually naked ambition? Is this a man who's being opportunistic and he's trying to drive this home? Or is this a moral crusade? This is a man who has seen things, having been put in that position and thought, I can't accept this uh, because he has been so much more vociferous than others. Now, I don't know the answer to that. I think one of the things that, that did sit a little uneasily is that he made these accusations. He said, I don't know who it was. I can't name names. I don't know who did it. And I don't think it was anyone on the board of directors. The point he said was, and he uses this, this lovely Spanish phrase, which you may have heard before. He said, but if an amount of work that should be costing around about 150,000 euros is costing almost a million euros and has been divided up into payments low enough to not be immediately kind of put through the auditing process. He said, it is clear that something's happened. And the phrase he used, that's a great Spanish phrase, he says, white and in a bottle. And that phrase in Spanish is white and in a bottle, it must be milk. In other words, it's self-evident, it's clear. And yet he's not actually providing evidence. What he's doing is providing the scenario and saying this can only be explained through some sort of corruption, through someone somewhere being in a position where they've got their hands in a till, but not blaming board members. The problem is that that needs to be stood up, which is why, of course, Barcelona initially threatened legal action and now say they actually are going to go ahead with this. Now, I assume, although you can very rarely assume anything at Barcelona, at the moment, that if they are going to take legal action on this, they believe they can win. Do you really think it's in the best interest of the club to go to court over this? No, absolutely not. Not least because it wouldn't be the only court case they're in, engaged in at the moment. I don't think it helps them in any way. And I think this is one of the other points in this, which is that if we make the assumption that these allegations were true, that there was a social media monitoring company or some sort of social media company trying to celebrate, defend, protect, project the reputation of the president. Quite apart from the question marks as to whether this is right or wrong, there is a fundamental point here, which is it didn't work. It didn't work because the weight of accusations, the weight of problems at the club, the number of issues they've had to deal with, the fact that Messi has come out twice publicly in less than three months to have a go at key directors at the club, the fact that things appear to be falling apart means that however much you project the kind of if you like the, the goodness of a president that doesn't stand up to the reality because the weight of evidence against it is so high and i don't mean the weight of evidence in terms of the accusations i mean just the amount of bad things going on now the next part of this is that then this this filters into what you're saying another court case even if barca are right even if they eventually win does not help the reputation does not help their position of strength 
just does not help them in any way. And to take it on to the next level in terms of this resignation, this mass resignation of six directors. Imagine a scenario in which all six of these directors are bad guys, in which all six of these directors are wrong, and in which all six of these directors, we know it was actually four to start with, not six, but all six of these directors were people that the president was trying to force out. You could argue the president won in this. Six directors resigned. He got what he wanted. He got better control of the board of directors. He got rid of bad people. He got loyalty back into the board. He got the right people around him. He surrounded himself with people he could trust. Great. So that's a victory. The problem is that if you're a president of a club, however much you may or may not be in the right, if six board directors resign at the same time, it does not reflect well on you. If only because at some level, somewhere, people might ask, well, you're not very good at choosing, are you? So I want to address something else that was mentioned in the letter, and that is the management of the club. That's one of the reasons that these board members said that they wanted to leave. And it would be great if you could kind of expand on maybe some of the dysfunction that they're referring to kind of in the letter. Was it the leadership of the president, Josep Maria Bartomeu, or is, is it something else? I think in a way, the, the choice of language there is significant because I think it's talking about something much broader than just Bartomeu. But of course, in a presidentialistic club, it always comes down to the president. And particularly in this case, because there is a sense, and bear in mind the context of this letter, the context of this letter is that this is two days after four of these six have been invited to leave. And they've been invited to leave because they can't actually directly be sacked. In other words, please go, get out of the way, we don't trust you. So there is a sense of disloyalty there and there is a sense there that they think, well, we've been told we can't be trusted by the president. And so this tells us something about the direction the club is going in. So there is a there is a mechanical boardroom dimension to this. But I think there's a much broader dimension to this, which is about things like the management of the of the construction of a new stadium, things like the loss of identity in terms of youth team players coming through into the first team, things like the sense that, hang on, how can we be in a position where our captain, Leo Messi, where the player that we most rely on, who we are absolutely terrified of in a, in a kind of a political with a small p sense, we are terrified of him. How can it be that he has twice come out publicly to criticise elements of the running of the club? How can it be that in the summer we chased Neymar and didn't get him? How can it be in the winter transfer we we decide we need a striker and by the end of the transfer window we haven't signed one but we have sold two how can it be that we lost Neymar in 2015 how can it be that since then we've signed uh, I must admit I can't remember the numbers here but I think it's 32 players spent nearly a billion euros and you can look at that list of players and think not one of those is an unqualified success. How can it be that we're going to court with Neymar, but we're still courting him? We still want him to come, and yet we're in court with him. We're arguing with him legally, but we want to sign him. How can it be that we had such a big argument with the players about the whole process of taking pay reductions because of the coronavirus case? How can it be that we're the first club in Spain, despite two months ago saying we were the richest club ever, that we generated more money than else, anyone else? We're the first Spanish club to get to a billion euros a year in turnover. How can it now be that we're the first that has to make pay cuts because of the coronavirus case. How can we be that vulnerable to a crisis like this, which is a crisis of no one's making, but it is a crisis that you have to be able to manage. And so I think when you look at all of those kind of elements, and I'm sure there are others, by the way, that I've missed out, there is, I think, a generalised sense that Barcelona has lost its way. Now, some of those things you can argue about. Some of those things you can say, this isn't the fault of the president. This isn't the fault of the board of directors. Actually, this isn't as much of a problem as it looks. But the cumulative effect of so many different elements, I think, is very, very powerful indeed. So how much of this does come down to the president? If we were to assign some sort of blame for him, you know, are we talking about partial blame, majority blame, full blame, no blame? Well, I think that's very, very difficult to do. But in a way, and at the risk of offering a very facile uh, response to that, in a way, I think at any club that is presidentialist, the buck stops with the president. Whatever else goes on below him, whatever else is done by others, the culture of the club, in theory, should be constructed, maintained, expressed, communicated and shared by that president. And if this much goes wrong, then you start to ask big questions. Now, there are things that have without doubt gone right at Barcelona with Bartomeu as well. There are things like the stability of, of, of management. This is the first time they've sacked a manager mid-season for, I think it's 16 or 18 years. But even that, you say, well, you've sacked a manager for the first time in the middle of the season. 
Reports suggesting Valverde is out. Kike Setien set to be announced as the new coach of Barca. You take Something has gone wrong here. Now, you can ask all sorts of questions like, is this the sporting director's fault? Is this the player's fault? Is this just the natural tail end, the decadence of a generation that was the best that Barcelona had that has now got old and some of them are left and some of them haven't and we haven't dealt with a transition plan as well as we might, but we were confronted by an impossible situation. All of these are legitimate questions, but in a situation in which you have a president at the top, then of course, ultimately responsibility comes down to him. And, and I think that's part of it. The other thing is you can look at it from a numbers point of view. And as I say, here's the numbers for you a billion euros worth of players in the last five years of which you can genuinely say not one is an unqualified success you can say there's been four directors of communication there's been I think it's five sporting directors there have been I think seven now vice presidents resign or walk away for one reason or another all of this since 2015 all of this since Bartomeu won presidential elections and you say well if you've got all of these numbers all of these people can they all be wrong and it never be you and i think that's the point it's in a way it's not really even about the specifics of each case it's about the cumulative effect of there being so many cases and fundamentally one man at the top still there so whose support does he still have at this point well, this is one of the one of the key questions here is whose support does he still have? Now, Bartomeu, of course, in theory, has the support of the board of directors because the reason this happened was about him trying to push out discordant voices, push out critical voices, make sure he has loyalty. He has until 2021 to be president. He cannot stand again, so he needs to find someone for his succession. Or indeed, he could decide he doesn't care and he doesn't want it. So in theory now, he has the support of the board of directors. Why? Because these are the people that he feels he can trust. Now, obviously, privately, there will be a lot of them who have doubts. There will be a lot of them who have concerns. There will be a lot of them who are thinking, yeah, he's still the president I would back, but I'm worried about some of this. There will equally be a lot of them thinking, well, I wonder if I might now become the successor. I wonder if I might now be the person in power. And that's part of the issue here, that there's a clear shifting and positioning and, and, and kind of power brokering going on. He also has support from a significant part of the media, as, as I mentioned before, El Mundo Deportivo in particular, and they will back him. But they will back him more because they see him as their guy, more because they see him almost, see themselves as kind of part of this project, if you like, and that they're both hateful towards and fearful of the opposition as it starts to build than because they're necessarily in Bartomeu's favour. And I think Bartomeu probably knows that if they needed to sacrifice him in order to have someone who they believe could still be on their side, I mean, this is, you know, this is kind of political grandee stuff, really. If they felt they needed to sacrifice him, they would do so. So who does he have on side? Well, he has the board of directors and parts of the media. And that's significant. And let's not pretend that absolutely everybody is against him. There will be fan members who are on his side as well. And it may well be that when he gets to elections, the continuity candidate that he chooses wins. Because of course, that's the other thing to bear in mind here. And this is something that I saw very clearly when I, I spent some time on the on the campaign trail in 2000 and it might even have been 15, but I think it was the elections before. There's a difference between Barcelona fans the world over and Barcelona fans who are members and therefore are the electorate. And that Barcelona electorate is relatively conservative. <laughs> You're talking about potential successors, one of which might be Victor Font, who might succeed Bartomeu. He said recently that, quote, we need to start from scratch. The management model that in recent years has allowed us to be the best multi-sport club in the world no longer works, end quote. So do you think that they need this total upheaval and this total remodeling of the club? Well, I think Victor Font, and it's very early to say this for sure, is an impressive candidate. And he is very much positioning himself in opposition. But I think broadly speaking, his idea is that this culture is wrong. You know, that whole structure and model is wrong. Now, I'm not sure if it necessarily is entirely wrong in some ways. And I think some of it is circumstantial. I think some of it is salvageable as well, without any doubt at all. I think some of it is because they reacted very badly to crises that they didn't anticipate. So, for example, a lot of this is about a generational question and the coming towards the end of the Messi era, which, of course, they had set up. They were ready for this. The successor to Messi was Neymar. They were going to work together and then Neymar carried on. But then when Neymar went, I think that did them a huge amount of damage because it put them in a situation in which all of those certainties were broken in terms of all of that sense of, right, where we go now, that was over and very quickly over. And they didn't really know what to do. And ever since Neymar, and I think we can see this, there's been this kind of desperation, if you like, to find something that fixes this. The damage it 
it did to them in terms of making them look weak, in terms of making them look like a club that players didn't want to play for anymore, in terms of the breakdown in relationship with some of the squad, because some of the squad believed that the club should have done more to persuade Neymar to stay. In terms of that kind of slightly embarrassing thing of trying to get Neymar back, in terms of the fact that the Neymar money, which was 222 million euros, Barcelona Direct came out and said, we can't spend all this money at once. If we spent 300 million euros just like that, uh, you know, it would be irresponsible and we'd have to resign. Well, within six months, they spent 300 million euros on Dembele and on Coutinho, one of whom has been injured consistently. And and although this isn't the club's fault, hasn't been able to have an impact in all of the time he's been at the club since. And the other who is now away on loan and they're desperately trying to sell him. So there's this sense of collapse off the back of something that they couldn't control that wasn't entirely their fault but also it poses questions about their preparedness for these kind of crises you know just as the coronavirus crisis isn't of their making but they haven't managed it well and so I think there will be elements of what they do which are salvageable you know this is a club that generates more money than any in the world that was top of Deloitte's rich list for the first time ever this year that is the biggest sporting brand on the planet in theory and yet of course they have a huge cash flow problem yet of course they have all of these if you like kind of modelic problems all these systemic problems within it and so I think I think there will be elements of it that can be maintained but but there's there's certainly a sense I think that, that if nothing else emotionally they need a shift of direction so if you were the new president of Barcelona you know they moved up the elections from next year to this year and they elected Sid Lowe president what changes would you make Oof. I think yeah, that's a, I mean that is this is one of the things I suppose isn't it that from the outside for us it's all very easy to criticize and you think okay well let's think about the the practicalities of this let's think about what you would do in positive terms to fix this I think there needs to be a reconnection with elements of their identity which have been lost I think there needs to be more of a tranquility to it all and and you know I, it's very easy after the event to be smart. But for example, I remember when they sold Neymar and, and this, you know, this is just one thing. It's not a kind of a policy objective, but I think it does fit in with that idea of a policy of calming things down, a policy of not kind of chasing and, and trying to be slightly less desperate in the approach to things. When they sold Neymar, I remember writing a piece basically saying what Barcelona should do now is nothing. That the worst thing they can do is go, I've got 220 million euros in my pocket. I've just lost this player who was everything to me. Oh my God, I've got to do something. Let's go and do it. And so they went and and signed Dembele when they didn't need to and at a vastly inflated price. They went and signed Coutinho at a vastly inflated price. Why? Because they were chasing something. So there's a bit of me that thinks, in a way, the first thing that needs to happen is stop. Stop. Do not chase this. You need to set a structure in place now and work within that structure. I think you need to get better people in charge. And and, and I feel very bad saying this, but for example, Eric Abidal, the sporting director, he's a man who was employed for the wrong reasons. He's a man who's very popular, a man who who had been, you know, a big part of that Barcelona team who has an incredibly important emotional story because of overcoming cancer and winning the European Cup. A man that kind of was seen as a connection between the club and, and the players, but a man who was put bluntly unqualified for that role. And so things like that, things that you have to structure it and say, okay, what do we believe in? What is our ideal? What's the way in which we approach these things? And go and do those things and have an idea and stick with it. And, and all of that is, is very easy to say and it's very difficult to do. And it's partly very difficult to do, in, of course, because as we've seen throughout Barcelona's history, this is a club, and it was Johan Cruyff who used the word entorno, the surroundings, all of that noise, all that political pressure, all of that criticism, all of that media pressure. This is a club that has to withstand a huge amount of pressure, a huge amount of very self-interested opposition at times as well. And so I think in part, the key thing that Barcelona need in a way is to withstand to be able to withstand that that pressure both internally and externally to chase and to be desperately doing things but of course it's football and football as they like to say in Spain in the end everything depends on whether or not the ball wants to go in You can follow all of Sid Lowe's La Liga coverage on ESPN.com The Guardian and the podcast that he co-hosts The Spanish Football Podcast This episode was produced by John McKenzie and Hugo Chambre. I'm Josh Schneiderweiler, and thanks for listening to Football Today. And if you enjoy this episode, why not subscribe to our new Patreon page or share this episode with a friend? See you next time.